same imaging in human populations with the medical computational challenges. Okay, I, I want to begin by thanking Laurent for the invitation and all of you for, for staying today. And just about everyone in the room has provided me with a different Mac to try to talk up. <laughs> so it finally works out. <laughs> So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about mathematics and computation used in the context of imaging. And so, not so much looking at the underlying, the underlying neuronal architecture, but large-scale patterns that can be seen in images from populations. And so, some of these imaging techniques are very familiar with um, MRI to look at brain structure, a pencil stack to look at uh, neuron metabolites, or, or um, uh, glucose metabolism. And then more fine-scale maps in the cortex looking at uh, doctor imaging, or electromagnetic imaging and the fine scale dynamics of neuronal activity. One of the problems with this is trying to get a sense of the population patterns in, 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 in human population images. And in a sense, integrate and compare the data from different modalities and across subjects. So, if you ask a neuroscientist what could be done with MRI or functional MRI, I mean, some of the main questions are you know, things like development or dimensions, bring you where it brain changes is occurring, the same question comes up in childhood development and aging and disease. How will changes be mapped? How early can these deficits be detected? And also, questions about dynamic changes in images, such as what are the growth rates in young children and scan serially with MRI? Uh, what are the changes in disease and can they be modulated by drug treatment? Typically, some of the more subtle questions, such as what are genes that affect the changes, what are risk factors, require you to aggregate imaging data from vast populations maybe 500, maybe 1,000 subjects. It's all going to talk about today some of the mathematics that would let you store brain data in a brain atlas, aggregate brain maps from large populations, and then develop criteria for the differences between groups or changes over time. So just so you know, you guys all know this, uh, rather than just using cat imaging or, or functional imaging, we'll talk a lot about uh, you know, it's essentially approaches to look at the fine scale structure of the cortex to the degree, degree that's available with uh, MRI today. For example, chemical thinning is a, is a measure of change. One of the problems with looking at data from different subjects is that everyone's brain geometry is different. And so if you want to make an aggregate of the brain function or brain structure in a group, it's really good to see if structural function are normal, uh, what is the range of normal variations, what is the average pattern of brain structure and diseases such as dementia, schizophrenia, the problem in sort of making a synthetic average from data that comes from a lot of different subjects. This also gets in the way if you want to say, well, what is in general the pattern of brain change in intellectual brain structure, or what are the genetic effects on brain structure? Again, you need a sort of database of maps and statistics that resolve patterns that are not seen in a single subject. So I'll talk a little bit about using MRI. Yeah, MRI is sort of a correlation among imaging modalities in that uh, it only resolves anatomy. There's been a lot of uh, developments in recent years, the first maps of brain growth in both children, the first maps of cortical pruning during adolescence have been published in the last couple of years, um, changes in the cortex and structure going on to, to adulthood and into old age, um, the first time-lapse movies of disease affecting the cortex, and then finally the first maps of how heredity and environment impact the structure of the cortex, all built from databases and all using maps to detect where the regions are that are linked with statistical assets of the population. So here's a car wash for brain images. So let, let's say you have a very large number of MRI scans. There are certain things that you can do analytically to see where it is that political features are affected by genetic risks or linked with symptoms in the population or linked with medication. Some of the steps are designed to isolate features in the images. Others are these very strange normalization transforms that try and eliminate the differences in the cortex that make one subject different from another. And that would allow us to make inferences about deviations from the average population variability and the significance of a group difference relative to a population. So the basic principle is you put all of the MRI data or PET data into a canonical coordinate system. Uh, whether it's Larry's atlases, uh, for animals, or human atlases, and the same coordinate across the a group will index the same anatomy. The trouble is that's not going to work for humans, and if you average 300 scans with MRI, all of the cortical geometry is gone. And so essentially the, the destructive interference of the anatomical signals has eliminated the things that we'd like to see. So how can we make an average brain for a population 
but not eliminate the features that we want to retain. Well, it's going to involve some mathematics to sort of store the geometric elements and derivatives across circuits in a framework to analyze them statistically and make inferences about average and differences in average in the population. So let's say you collect a thousand brain scans when MRI is set for in special position, brain mapping uh, on the sites of UCLA, another thousand scans of children and teens will be selected by our colleagues at my age. One of the first things to make attractable to see the patterns is to parameterize the cortex. Essentially, you take a spherical mesh structure and suck it onto the cortex. And then one of the things that you can do is actually a little bit like Jeff's talk, looking for conformal maps in the cortex. You can either project this like structure onto the cortex or spherical structures onto the cortex. This then becomes a computation space to start to make comparisons from one subject to another. So let, let's look at the tissue classifier that, that, that isolates where the gray matter of the cortex is in these scans. One of the things that you can then do is build finite element models in the cortex that adapt to the geometry, and then measure the thickness of the cortex in an individual subject. Now this can now be done with exquisite resolution with MRI, by giving you a very detailed map of cortical thickness, but then you can go into a database and start to make inferences about in different populations. So the only anatomist on the color, for example, made composite maps of cortical thickness. Now this can be done automatically um, to the degree that you can see the structure and combining data on polygon thickness or other parameters of cortex in a large database. Now this is one of the hardest problems in human brain uh, You'll see here that if we like to compare an individual uh, patient perhaps with a control, you may have exquisite information about polygon function or structure, but you may be unable just due to the anatomic differences to compare that subject with a database. So one of the approaches, uh, and Jeff was talking about this a little bit in terms of laying out the geometry of the cortex, this was obviously pioneered by Van Essen and others who were looking for the flat maps. One of the approaches we've taken is to take the geometry I talked about that had a spherical parameterization, mash it down into 2D, and then build models that essentially lay out the geography of the cortex in 2D, and then compute transformations like this one that fluidly reconfigure the cortical anatomy of one subject so that it matches the anatomy of another subject. Now, there's actually a trick that you can use with this. Let's say you average MRI scans together, and let's say you extracted the cortex of that average scale. You'd get this sort of lousy looking scan with all the features destructively cancelled. Suppose you flatten the geometry of cortex, but at each point you retain information on the XYZ position in space of where that point is flattened from. So red, green, blue colors can encode that. Let's say red of 10, green of 20, uh, uh, blue of 30 indexes the point with location 10, 20, 30 in stereotactic space. Turns out that if you can back this information, along with a fluid mapping that aligns this anatomy to a common template, if you average these images, and then you decode them back into a spatial map, you get a crisp average geometry for the cortex. And it is, it's sort of a nice trick, but it enables you to essentially constructively interfere features in a population in a way that they were destructively cancelled uh, with other approaches. So let's look at a simple question. 46 people with Alzheimer's disease, does that cortex look thinner with MRI, and why does it look thinner than match controls? Well, the nice thing with this point of pattern matching is that there are sort of islands of territory that are preserved in dementia, and then islands that are very, uh, comparatively speaking, thin in terms of the total structure. So let's take this a little bit further. Um, is, is it correct? Well, this is a map of average for the thickness of Alzheimer's disease relative to healthy controls. All these geometric nuisances that have been uh, factored out, uh, they're, they're destructively, uh, almost like destructively interfering here. And the, the map of deficits very well agrees with post-mortem maps of amyloid, but it is actually the work model that's, that's interrupted the course. So let's make the database bigger. Well, let's scan everyone who comes to UCLA with a complaint about Alzheimer's disease every three months for a year and a half. So let, let's make a map of the political thickness when they first come to the clinic. Every three months for, 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 for a year and a half, and map the deficit in cortical thickness at each of those visits. Now, one of the things that this lets you do is make a time lapse movie of cortical thinning in a population. And so the white areas are the regions with significant cortical thinning. I mean, here, over the year and a half is, is sort of compressed into a few seconds. But you can begin to see what the anatomical progression is of the disease, essentially by mapping all of these uh, cortices 
uh, into a common coordinate system. This sort of hippocampal to limbic spread in the areas or like sensory areas that are, are compatible with sort of in dementia. You sort of begin to reconstruct the pathology of the disease, even though the database is only in vivo. So, you know, this is obviously validated against post-mortem measures of uh, the intactness of the cortex. And what it is, some intriguing areas that are spared late in the disease are uh, mirrored in the MRI scan. So that's, that's rather nice. Uh, another way that you can use the database is you say, well, I have a symptom or a, a behavior that I would like to see if it's linked with any attribute on the cortex. And so, for example, so for example, you could link cognitive performance with the thickness of the cortex, very crude measure, but in fact, it turns out to be quite tightly linked with a, a measure of mini mental cognitive performance. Lower performance, more fully in these areas, areas that aren't linked, for example, central motor cortex, and not areas that are famous uh, as being involved in, in, in high quality function. So that, that's, uh, that makes sense. So again, databases of uh, rates of brain metal loss could be used in the clinical setting. Um, and also they can be used to sort of estimate an individual's deviation from the database. And then that is referenced against normal variation structure to give you a map of the abnormality of the subject. So this also can be used not just to compare populations, but an individual or a group. So other interesting features is the brain asymmetric. Well, we, we know it is. If you compare a very large database of 100 um, um, right hemispheres with 100 left hemispheres, and use the whole map based on 20, you can begin to see these features of asymmetry. It's almost as though the right hemisphere is torqued forward relative to the left. But things that wouldn't be occurring in a single subject would come out on average. So I, I think I'll skip these slides a little bit because only a few, a few minutes left. I do want to talk about some of the modeling uh, to make this more useful for um, for clinical use. So let's say we have a model of cortical thinning over the human life cycle. You could look at a giant statistical model of all the possible factors that could affect cortical thinning uh, over, over human life. And essentially plot the estimated parameters back onto the cortex. So at what age are you when your cortical thickness is maximal? Well, maybe that varies by our time region. So you can begin to build a database of, uh, again, for cortical thickness, the trajectory over the human lifespan for different regions of cortex. And notice how incredibly heterogeneous it is. If you, if you look at the um, pattern in which the cortex changes between the age of seven and then I think the oldest subject is eight or seven. There's a remarkable heterogeneity to the way in which the cortex ages. And so rather than thinking of this as sort of a binary process that affects the cortex uniformly, um, if this is uh, you know, our entire life collapsed over a period of seconds, as you get into old age, the areas of the capital temporal cortex that are famous for early changes are the ones that are selected in the and, it, and century motor cortex is preserved until comparatively late in life. Now, last of all, we've talked a lot about cortical plasticity uh, earlier in the day and things that uh, allow your cortex to remodel throughout life. One question addressable with databases is to what degree do the networks of environmental factors uh, have a role in uh, the structure of the human cortex? Um, if you have enough twins, and luckily one in 87 people is a twin, uh, you'll be able to collect the database of the twin MRI scans. This is the way work by Michael Gazzaniga and Gartner who are looking at twin differences in structure. If you look at all these maps and say, tell me how different different subjects of the same age are. I mean, what, what is the difference in, again in, in our favorite measure of quantum fitness? You can then express the twin differences, here identical twins, as a fraction of that interpersonal variation. Now, what, what's the point of this? Well, if the fraction of variation is very small, you know that genetics has a, an almost determining complete role in structuring the cortex in those areas. If identical twins who have exactly the same DNA are as different as you or I in cortical structure, then we know that the environment or non-genetic factors uh, are the main determining factor in, in uh, establishing neuroanatomy. There's actually some intriguing results from this. So if you do all of the genetic analysis properly, you can carry through all the stages and measure of the degree to which your product structure is inherited, with one being completely and zero being that your genes don't make any difference to the structure of the cortex. A lot of our favorite areas of cortex, the frontal cortex, which is uh, the most recent in evolution, is obviously responsible for some of the higher order cognitive processes that we're interested in. Very paradoxical, it's almost entirely genetically determined what the structure is in those regions 
it's no surprise that some of the deep temporal structures that uh, are implicated in learning and memory are not heritable at all. You can see the sort of human graphic map of inheritance and the degree to which the variation that we've seen earlier is, uh, well, that's, that's irritating noise that you've warned me about. <laughs> okay, so actually this, this is the last slide. So what can image databases tell us? See, even if you restrict yourself to structural MRI, which is not the most enjoyable imaging modality, um, you, you can actually make dynamic maps of diseases spreading, uh, schizophrenia, uh, growth patterns in the brain. You can calibrate individual scans against the database to see where the anomalies are. Um, clinical uh, uses include uh, looking at uh, drug treatment, so you could, for example, see if these, if these processes are slow. One of the most interesting of all is that we really don't know what are the genetic determinants of cortical structure. And the biggest surprises that have come out of structural imaging and inheritability research is just the phenomenal degree to which uh, your genetic blueprint determines the structure of your cortex. Now that may not be borne out of function. We, we simply don't know. But that will be the next uh, sort of uh, stage in, 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 in constructing the analysis to see if the functional of your cortex is inherited the same degree of structure. Thank you very much. Well, it seems to be interesting.